So here we are. So we're going to carry on with the uh, just a little bit. Uh, so now we come to the second of the five khandas. So the first of the five khandas is basically form. And form is anything which has a shape, yeah, appearance in the world. Uh, that is basically what it comes to, including the physical bodies, include that anything you see, anything you relate to in that way is form. Uh, and obviously a very important part. Yeah, This is how we recognize each other, etc., etc. Uh, and now we come to the second of the five khandas. This is the Vedana khanda. So these are the five heaps. Yeah. So this is, again, the core aspect of the human personality. That's why they are singled out by the Buddha in this way. Uh, form is what is very important to us as individuals. Uh, yeah. So it is a kind of critical part of our person, if you like. Feeling is incredibly important, right? Feeling is really, if, if there's anything that, uh, and I will, I think it's hard to underestimate or overestimate the importance of feeling because feeling is really what drives us as human beings. Any kind of intention you have, any kind of desires you have, any kind of craving, any kind of pursuit, any kind of search is driven by feelings. Feelings are like what gives anything value. Without feelings, things don't have value anymore. Imagine that you experience something without feeling. What does that mean? If I, you experience something, let's say I'm going to drink this, uh, but it doesn't feel like anything. Yeah? yeah, it's neither positive, nor negative, nor neutral. And it doesn't mean anything anymore, right? It doesn't have any, absolutely, it becomes completely irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> let's test like this experiment. <laughs> it feels very nice, right? It feels nice. So because it feels nice, uh, and it also soothes the throat a little bit, it has kind of many kind of nice qualities. Uh, it's kind of very useful. Right? So it has a feeling to it. One is the taste. Another one is the feeling in the throat that it kind of helps out. Whatever it is, it has meaning because it has feeling. So feeling is what gives meaning. So if there wasn't any feeling in the world at all, you wouldn't be doing anything. You would have no motivating, nothing to motivate you to act. And what that means is that if we can understand feeling, this one thing fully, and understand that that is a problem, that is unsatisfactory, that is non-self, that is out of control. If you can understand that one thing, then all meaning is taken out of existence. Yeah, Nothing has meaning any, anymore, nothing has purpose, because the, the entire thing which motivates us to do anything in the world, that thing mm -hmm. is seen to be problematic, to be out of control, and then we can kind of, uh, uh, then you can become take this path really all the way to the end as a consequence of that. Uh, so this is what you find in the sutta, as you find many places where uh, the monks will be contemplating feelings, Vedana. And they, through that very contemplation, they often end up becoming, not often, that's kind of an exaggeration, they occasionally end up becoming arahants. Uh, yeah? The monks, the nuns, uh, uh, not sure if there are any lay people contemplating feelings, but anyway, you, you get the idea. So what then does the Buddha have to say about these feelings? That becomes interesting then, yeah? If it is such an important part of life, uh, if it is such an important thing that gives things value in life, the thing that really kind of uh, makes, makes us do anything, uh, if we can understand these feelings, well, it becomes very useful. Uh, so what does the Buddha have to say about feelings? Uh, and this is what uh, he has to say. Uh, suppose it was the time of autumn, when the rain was falling heavily, and a bubble on the water forms and pops right away. Yeah, so this is kind of the idea of a bubble. Yeah, you see a bubble forming outside anywhere, the bubble forms. And how long does it last? It lasts, sometimes it lasts a very short time, sometimes maybe a little bit longer. But a bubble is not very, very inherently, incredibly unstable. And so it goes very quickly. And the bubbles on the water. And a person with clear eyes would see it and contemplate it and examine it carefully. And it would appear to them as completely void, hollow, and insubstantial. For what substance could there be in a water bubble? Yeah? Not much substance to a water bubble. Yeah, zero substance, basically. Comes, arises, passes away. Another one comes, blop, passes away. Yeah, one after the other, water bubbles. In the same way, what? Dukkha. In the same way, a mendicant sees and contemplates any kind of feeling at all. 
Yeah, so remember now we come back to what we're talking about before. All kinds of feelings are included in this past, present, and future, internal, external, coarse, and fine, superior and inferior. Uh, probably forgot for some of those pairs, but anyway, all kinds of feelings are included, right? Uh, and when you examine those feelings carefully, it appears to them as completely void, hollow, and insubstantial. For what substance could there be in feeling? Yeah. yeah. So the um, idea here, when you look at the feelings, especially you know this idea when something is positive or negative or neutral to you, you will see how quickly it changes all the time. Yeah. Sometimes maybe you are eating your food downstairs, think, oh, delicious food, yeah, wonderful, and you're very happy eating the food. And then someone says something you don't want to hear, and immediately that's kind of painful, right? So you hear some, you eat something nice, the next moment something negative happens, and then you're back on the food again, it's nice. And then you, uh, you touch something that is kind of not pleasant, it's too cold or whatever, like a negative feeling. Yeah. So you can see how these feelings kind of come and go incredibly rapidly, yeah. and it all depends entirely on what you are attending to at any moment. That attention flits around, yeah, back and forth from one thing to the next one. Yeah. And of course the problem is that very often we're not really in charge of these feelings. Yeah. These feelings just come from the classic example is the body. Yeah. The body has endless amounts of painful feelings. Yeah, yeah you try to sit meditation in, even for a short time and guaranteed you're going to get some kind of pain in the body somewhere. Because that's just the nature of this body. Yeah. Endless problems. Yeah. And there is no way you're going to be able to control it. Sometimes the food is nice, but sometimes the restaurant lets you down. Yeah, you know what it's like. You go to the restaurant and think, who cooked this? This is, you know, have we got a new chef or something? I want to, let's see this chef. This is some incompetent chef behind the scenes or whatever it is. Sometimes it just doesn't work out. Sometimes we think things are going to be okay. They're not. In the end, we're not really in control. Feelings arise. Feelings pass away. The reason why the feelings are there is because of cause and conditions. Uh, yeah, the cause and conditions change. Uh, everything changes as a consequence. Uh, the main cause and the main cause and condition for how you feel uh, is uh, where you get reborn, uh, right? Certain uh, kinds of rebirth leads to lots of really terrible feelings. Uh, other kinds of rebirth lead to really great feelings. Uh, that is the main cause and condition. Uh, can you control where you get reborn? Uh, in the end, you can't really control that either, because in the end, karma, some lives to do good karma, other lives to do bad karma. And in the end, you don't know what you're going to make for the future. So feelings are fundamentally out of control. And when you understand that feelings are just coming and arising, arising and passing away, depending on cause and conditions, you understand that the very thing that give life, gives life value, the very thing that motivates us in the world to do anything at all, that very thing is really out of your control. And it means that your purpose in life, your aims in life, all of that also is kind of ultimately out of control. And you don't really know, you know, it's just, uh, uh, there's nothing you can really do about it in the ultimate, the final analysis. And so it is fundamentally problematic. So this is the idea of feelings, yeah? Popping into existence, disappearing again, and not really being under your control in the larger scheme of things. So now we come to the idea of perception. And uh, perception is a very complicated and, and large thing. And uh, it is hard almost to kind of fully comprehend how much of life is about perception. We discussed this a little bit before. But uh, as, again, it is basically how we make sense of the world. Every time you categorize something, you place it into a category. You say it is like this or it is like that. Every time you, you uh, hear something or taste something and you, you, you think about something, everything is perceived. Yeah? That is how you make sense of things. It's a very, very large category of, uh, uh, of um, uh, what it means to be a human being, if you like. A yeah? very important part of our sense of identity comes from perception. Yeah? And do we attach to perceptions? Absolutely. Yeah, we attach to perceptions, the idea, certain ways we want the world to be. We want to be happy. Uh, we want to, some days you wake up in the morning, you feel a bit funny, you don't really feel like yourself. Uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, you perceive, your perception is kind of fooling around with you. Uh. 
So suppose that in the last month of the summer, at noon, a shimmering mirage appears. And a person with clear eyes would see it and contemplate it, examining it carefully. Yeah, mirage. And a mirage is like, you know, you are traveling on the road and maybe there's a hot day and it looks like there's water on the bitumen. But actually there's no water there. It's just a, it's just a mirage. Yeah, you come close, it's actually gone. So this is what he means by the idea of mirage. So you, a person with eyes would see it, you contemplate and examine the mirage carefully. And it would appear to them as completely void, hollow, and insubstantial. But what substance could there be in a mirage? Yeah. This is kind of really powerful again. A mirage. A mirage. It's almost like it doesn't exist at all, right? It's a complete... You're completely fooled by something. That's what a mirage really means. And uh, so uh, this is a very powerful idea about uh, what perception actually is like. Uh, let's kind of go to the other side of, the, of the, uh, the simile here. In the same way, a mendicant sees and contemplates any kind of perception at all. Yeah? Again, remember, this includes all perceptions present, past, and future, internal, external, fine, and coarse, examining it carefully, and it appears to them as completely void, hollow, and insubstantial. But what, could, what substance could there be in perception? And so this is um, a bit concerning, yeah, if it is just like a uh, mirage, because that means that so many of the things that we think about the world, the way we uh, consider the world, Actually, there's probably nothing really there. And uh, this is, uh, on the one hand, it is concerning because when you try to hold on to a mirage, uh, you have a big problem. You can't really hold on to it. Uh, it's going to kind of, you're going to be pulled away from you so easily. Uh, but on the other hand, the positive side of this is that if perception like a mirage, uh, it means that we can also change our perceptions quite easily. Uh, yeah, and this is exactly what we are doing now. Because remember, we're talking about perceptions in a very broad sense here. We talk about the perception of impermanence, the perception of non-self, the perception of non-ill will, the perception of uh, uh, nekama, of uh, giving up, all of these kind of things. Yeah. So we are talking about developing our perceptions. Uh, and if perceptions are like mirages, uh, it means that can be shifted around very easily as well. Uh, we can develop them, we can change them. Uh, Things are not solid at all. Things are very fluid and very much in flux. And so because this is about aligning our perceptions, our views, with the way the Buddha sees the world, it means we can actually do that precisely because of the hollowness of these things. We can choose how we want to perceive things. It is not as easy as you may think because even though it is a mirage, yeah, still we have very strong habits. These things are formed from the past, uh, and because they are very strong habits, uh, we have a tendency to see things in a certain way. Uh, but it's still difficult to do. Uh, but the fact that they are really hollow, that there's nothing substantial to those things, yeah? And I often like to use the idea of whether a person is an enemy or, or a friend. Uh, and the reason I like that idea is because a very important part of Buddhist practice uh, is to have more metta for everyone, have more compassion. Uh, yeah, and uh, very a lot of the... Uh, problem with having metta is because we see people in the wrong way. We perceive them as enemies, or we perceive them as bad, or we perceive them as problematic, or we perceive them as irritating, or whatever it is. And because we look at people in the wrong way, yeah, um, then that is a kind of perception, and that is kind of the enemy perception versus the friend perception. So, but what is a person? Are they an enemy? Or are they a friend? And, the, and you start to realize, actually, you can't even tell because, um, you know, if, even though you may be or you may be a friend to somebody, someone else is going to be their enemy. So who is right? Is this person bad or are they good? Are they just neutral? Are they, you know, and you start to understand that these things are so subjective. They don't really have any inherent essence at all. They're just kind of moving around all the time. And once you start to understand the in hollowness of these kind of things, you should also understand the power you have over them, uh, how you can change your perception, how you can see things differently, uh, how you can look at everyone in the world uh, with the idea of friendliness, with the idea of compassion, because of this uh, changeability of perceptions. Uh, this is kind of the good news. Yeah? 
And so what all you have to do is you have to set to work, start to get going, and then as you start to get going, these things will start to come into place, fall into place as a consequence. And so then you get more, you feel more, uh, you feel more um, hopeful that you can change. Yeah, you feel more hopeful that it is possible to have metta towards everyone. You start to take the simile of the saw seriously. Does everyone know the simile of the saw? Everyone, no, anyone does not know the simile of the saw? Huh? No? Do you know the simile of the saw? Don't know the saw? Okay, because you are more, maybe more newcomer, so you don't know the simile of the saw. The simile of the saw is one of the similes that is very kind of, when you read it, you think, wow, the Buddha is asking too much. And uh, what the Buddha says is that even if someone grabs hold of you, they put you on the ground, uh, and two bandits they take a large saw, and they saw you apart, limb from limb, yeah, imagine taking a saw and kind of cutting off your arms, cutting off your legs. Even if someone does that to you, you should have compassion and loving kindness towards them. Yeah? <laughs> so that is what the Buddha says. And that's kind of setting the bar very, very high yeah, for, what it may, for how we should live. But uh, the point is, because perception is so malleable, actually it is possible to do that. And now you kind of get an idea why it is possible. But... Um, uh, another perception is that time is going faster. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I will suggest that we just do a little bit of meditation before we uh, take a break for lunch very soon. Huh?